All righty. Um, welcome, team. Um, it's great to be back. We've gone live once again. Um, obviously, tonight um, we've got another topic and another guest on board. We're exceptionally lucky to have this person with us. For everybody who doesn't know who I am, you should by now. Uh, I'm Simon, director, uh, founder of Prackmed NZ. Um, uh, and of course, tonight we have a special guest. Um, instead of sitting here and uh, divulging his CV for you, I'm going to allow him to introduce himself as well. So I'm going to hand over to tonight's special guest, and that is, of course, Steve-O. Tell us a bit about yourself, Steve-O. What's your background, man? Hey, out there in uh, Facebook Live land, I'm uh, Steve-O, uh, the big Steve-O. Um, so I'm a, an ex-New uh, Zealand Army medic. I did a bit of time there around or eight years, I think, by the end of it. Uh, did a couple of little overseas jaunts to East Timor and Afghanistan on ops, and then a couple of overseas little trips for humanitarian stuff and exercises to uh, Tuvalu and to the West Island over in Australia. And then after that, I got out of the army and went over to Australia and um, became a nurse. So from New Zealand Army medic to nurse, and then I put my nursing into practice and went and became a contractor over in Africa doing a few things over there for a few years. And then while I was there, I had a bit of downtime. So I looked at a bit of further study options and studied paramedicine. Uh, with the great and powerful COVID, I decided to chuck away the contracting life and come back to New Zealand. And now I'm back here working as a nurse in my local ED. Uh, yeah, that's kind of my short version of my CV. I'm not gonna <laughs> make one about myself too much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, crazy, man. Um, yeah, quite the story there, and you know, a real plethora, um, a real spread of kind of experience and also qualifications. It's it's fairly unique um, to see somebody, you know, of course, having that background in paramedicine uh, and also nursing, of course, employed in that role now. Um, and of course, with the history that you've got overseas, you know, it's very hard to kind of kick that in the butt and kind of leave it behind. But here we are. Um, so absolutely epic. Um, obviously, tonight, um, I'd just like to introduce the topic in just a second. Thanks for the introducing yourself there, Steve-O. Um, tonight we're going to talk about decision making, um, you know, uh, how we keep it together, give you guys who are listening, who are tuned in a few mental tools, uh, a few tools out there which maybe could help you uh, when you find yourself in a critical incident. Before I do that, I just want to acknowledge uh, today we had a really serious mass casualty incident down in Dunedin. Um, the situation, uh, obviously, we, we don't understand what actually has happened in, in regards to why it has happened. Uh, all we know is that a number of people, five in fact, were stabbed uh, in the supermarket down in the South Island. So, um, you know, for, for what it's worth, I know, you know, thoughts and prayers aren't worth much on the old Facebook, but um, from Team Prackmed at least, uh, you know, we genuinely feel for you and I think this is you know an opportunity to go through and say hey look you know trauma anytime anywhere we need to step things up and really get um, get things squared away uh, you know the the typical first aid courses that we're finding out there um, are just not cutting the mustard and that's the reason why we exist either way um, let's hope those people pull through survive and obviously get through the other side so um, yeah um, okay, so look, we're, we're going to pretty much dive straight into it uh, here tonight. Um, look, both both of us have spent quite a bit of time overseas. I spent a uh, total of just under uh, seven years, around seven years, uh, in hostile environments. Out of the 15, I was employed in uh, military and contracting uh, roles as well globally. Um, you spent a lot of time overseas as well. Um, yeah. And, you know, during, during those times, you know, uh, there, there is a whole range of experiences that you have uh, which get absolutely chaotic. And, and something that I find, you know, running BLS courses or basic life support courses uh, is that people overthink things. People go through, they get really wound up about things. And, and one of the big things which I found, um, you know, with regard, especially when I first got away, when I first uh, started experiencing some interesting uh, sticky positions and stuff like that to be in was uh, making sure that you just keep things simple, stupid. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, having a, having a process there, and that may sound a little bit kind of wishy-washy, but, you know, you, you've really got to fall back onto that training. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it is it is one of those things. I mean, how, how have you found things? I mean, your, your situation over in Africa, I know we've kind of talked a little bit just before we came on live here, and you said to us, you know, um, or you've, you've said to us previously that you've gone through and had so much more experience when you're overseas uh, in Africa in terms of the, the, the situations that you were in, uh, as opposed to your experience with the NZDF. Is there anything you want to talk about? Um, is there anything we want to kind of elaborate on? Maybe uh, the first time you felt things were getting real hairy or anything like that? I don't know um, if you want to elaborate. 
Yeah, so uh, there, there was a situation there. Uh, the first time that one of the guys that I was working with was was killed, and that's when it all sort of really became real for me about this, you know, being on a, working on a two-way range. In the NZDF, we just don't really we don't really know, know about that. We, we make up a lot of, uh, you know, we talk a lot about it, but we don't really know much about it until it's actually happening to you. you now, when mortars are falling and machine guns are firing and, uh, BMPs are shooting, you know, that's when you really sort of get into the real chaos of, of war. And mm. the NZDF doesn't really prepare you for that very much, which is, you know, okay, that's fine. But um, yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, you know, that, that situation, the was, sorry, go yeah, ahead. When that, when that happened, that first time, that's when I sort of, you know, had that bit of, um, you know, 50 cent, five cent moment and thought, like, this is real. Like, oh my, this, this is, this is the real deal here and i remember i was sitting in my vehicle and i was looking out the window and i could see everything happen i could see the you know, the bush getting shot up and destroyed and that and then the radio come you know, starts cracking to life hey we've got a casualty hey we need the medic out here and i thought like, oh okay that's me um here we go time to do the mahi and it's like now i've got to get, get out when there's uh pointy bits of metal flying around everywhere and you've got to just really you know sort of i don't know see how much testicular fortitude you've got to get out of your nice safe armored vehicle and go across in the bush and try and find out what's going on and of course that's that was amplified for, for me because i was working with uh the pe local people to that region and there were some communication issues so it's a case of just really focusing on what was important right at that time that that's sort of what my decision making process like what is the most dangerous thing right now and how can i fix that 100 percent and i think um you know when you look at the principles and we're going to talk about this very very shortly in terms of algorithms which keep you keep you alive out there um it was exactly the same thing i remember the first time that i ever had uh, rounds and coming and so on um and just feeling insanely angry uh about what was going on you know um just just super super pissed off and it was it was very very interesting watching guys go through um there was other guys who went through different processes you know uh and you know i'm absolutely not judging or anything like that um i was mm, in the position yeah, right. i was there in the position they were and whatnot you know you, you never know until you're in that predicament uh it, it yeah, can get real, right. real but yeah going through um obviously you know um you revert to your level of training i find you know um that's something which became very very apparent to me um, when when we were hitting uh, when we were in that kind of situation and sitting there and going holy hell you know this is legit and and so much of some of the training kind of really came to life and then some of it was just like man you know you reflect on it especially in the days that or the hours the days the weeks after in particular and even months and years in some cases you go back and you think about the stuff and you're like man you know that one time we were talking about that stuff that is just ridiculous you know? yeah. <laughs> that is never yeah. good. Um, <laughs> that's not what you <laughs> it's just incredible and you know um it's 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 no it's no fault of the nzd for anything like that you know we're, we're certainly not um slinging any kind of um any shade their way you know they do a fantastic job um i'm incredibly yeah. proud of you know my service with the nzd and whatnot um you know it was it was an amazing opportunity i'm incredibly thankful for that um you know and and guys can only go through and teach what they know you know and it's as simple as that but when it comes to the crunch you know there, there is no better way to go through uh, yeah. and learn what works and I what mean, doesn't i know in my, in my, new, job, in my new job now I, I tell people like you know the army it made me it's the old catchphrase it made me the man i am today because when i think about myself before i joined the military yeah compared to well after i've been in the military what a huge change and yeah yeah just that way you get that bit of mana that bit of pride to go out there and do the work that, that was huge it was amazing yeah 100 percent set you up really well and i think um you know going out there you know um and getting a bit of time overseas and just learning the basics of you know being isolated or being in a country where people are literally trying to kill you and whatnot you know you, feel, <laughs> you kind of figure things out you know and, and you work out whether you go or not you know whether this is your cup of tea or not and the, the df is fantastic for that look we're, we're going to kind of stay on board you know I, I could sit here and talk for weeks you know i could um <laughs> it's great maybe we can revisit that later on you know the the real worry stuff later um, but tonight we're going to talk really specifically around med, um, in particular around, uh, and I think we've got a pretty good introduction there. Uh, when the shit starts flying around and when when the bangs start going off, you know, um, you know, obviously it doesn't always work out. Missions 
uh, fall over. And, and not just that either, you know, people fall over in civilian life every single day. Uh, today, literally driving away from a, um, a rehab appointment, I came across a guy who had fallen over, quickly jumped out to check, make sure he's okay, he was. It's awesome. But this stuff happens all the time. You know, uh, Dunedin today was another example of that. And when, when it comes to these critical incidents, one of the common denominators that I get, one of the questions that keeps on popping across uh, when we're going through and training this stuff uh, at basic life support level for people who are not doing this every day or not employed in these roles is I don't even know where to start. So this is where we go through and we're going to get introduced and we're going to start talking about algorithms a little bit here. And these are tools. These are super important. You, you cannot understate the worth of this. Now, I, I say that all the time. I, I'm a massive advocate for them. And we're going to talk about two in particular today. Doctors ABCD, which is the uh, New Zealand or Australia New Zealand Resuscitation Council's uh, guideline or, or best practice uh, mnemonic for, um, you know, going through and uh, initiating resuscitation. And then, of course, we're going to talk about March as well. We'll, we'll look at the pros and the cons, you know, in, in a civilian setting of Doctors ABCD versus March. So, um, yeah, Doctors ABCD, that's um, obviously been adopted. That's what we teach uh, within a lot of the courses with PracMed. Um, danger response, send for help, check the airway if they're not breathing, or check the breathing if they're not breathing, obviously initiate CPR and defibrillation. It is a yep. fantastic algorithm to use, but it does leave out one massive glaring uh, kind of uh, uh, area where it does, just doesn't cover. And obviously this is something that we're incredibly passionate about here at PracMed NZ, and that's bleeding. So I don't, I don't know, from, from a perspective of working in an emergency department as a nurse, how, how do you feel about that, Steve? Like, I mean, you, you see this stuff every single day, that the end result uh, in a civil setting and have, you know, uh, more, light years more experience than what I do. Uh, with this stuff, how, how do you how do you feel about this? Like in terms of Dr. ABCD and maybe the the uh, leaving that bleeding side out. Yeah, so I, I know exactly what you're getting at. And when you when you when you look at the you know, doctors ABCD, it, it works really well for medical emergencies. And it works really well for you know for things like asthma and seizures and things like that. But I think what people forget is the bleeding side of it, and the, the bleeding is what's going to kill you first. We spent a lot of time learning about in the military and all this preventable death and everything about us, about how bleeding is the most important thing. And even during my, when I was studying nursing, massive hemorrhage was, it was just basically kind of glossed over in the civilian world. And even to the case or to the story, to the, the degree of where, you know, tourniquets were essentially forbidden, which is mm. just crazy. I think people just don't really understand. You know, we've been drilled in this dogma is that airway, you know, airway breathing, airway breathing. That's so important. And we're finally now with you know with, with stop the bleed sort of stuff with Prac Med and the big stop the bleed drives in America, realizing how important stopping bleeding is because there's no use putting air in and pumping the heart if all the blood, all that transport system is just pouring out on the floor. I mean, blood does no use to you if it's not in your circulation. If, you know, and that also counts for internal bleeding and you know, bleeding into long bone cavities. So, you know, seeing it in practice and you know, seeing it in the hospital, mainly when people get to the ED, if massive bleeding is not controlled, they'll be dead. Mm. That, that unless you have a, you know, unless you get a traumatic amputation or something outside the hospital in the car park, mm. then if the basic life support is not done well, and then the paramedic side, they don't, you know, step it up from there, the patient won't survive the hospital, essentially, you know. If you're not yeah. doing direct pressure, you're not controlling that, that indirect pressure, you're not putting on some sort of uh, tourniquet or a pressure bandage, you won't make it to hospital. That, yeah, it's, 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 quite, it's quite incredible how things have evolved, eh? I remember, you know, when we went through, uh, you know, obviously our tactical uh, medical courses within the military, Back in, back in the day, you know, back in the early 2000s and whatnot, you know, we had guys who were obviously coming through, um, you know, teaching us. Uh, I think when, when we first came through, it was like ABCs. It was like airway breathing circulation. Yeah, um, there, was, there was very little focus on a lot of this stuff, which obviously started coming to the light. Um, and then all of a sudden around, I think, 2008 or nine, maybe nine, it would have been, uh, 
we had uh, the March mnemonic come through. Um, and this, this is one which is still kind of used by military. There's, there's a bunch of variations of it out there. Um, but March is kind of, kind of uh, it's a similar kind of process, but it prioritizes massive bleeding. March, obviously, massive bleeding, airway, respiration, circulation, head, uh, hypothermia, head injury. So th th there is variations of it out there. Um, and it is a very, very, very good tool. Um, when, when you look at March as such, what, what do you think? I mean, do you think it has a place here on uh, in, in terms of civilian street? Or, you know, do you think it's a little in depth? When I, when I look at it, I kind of think, it's probably a little bit far down the line, you know. Uh, when we when we look at things like, um, you know, the the resp and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, going through into the circulation and uh, all these other bits and pieces and and so on, I, th I think there's aspects which could be useful. But when you look at it from the COT tri C side of the house, what they actually prescribe, uh, what March really actually is, uh, it's just a little bit too in depth for uh, basic life support here. Um, and I think Doctor ABCD has the balance right. But I just think it just needs that uh, bleeding control side of the house. What, what's your thoughts, man? Yeah, so I, I totally agree. And you know, March has the benefit of being good for soldiers because you know, March, marching, all that sort of jazz. And mm. you know, March really sort of focuses on it's kind of aimed towards some more advanced stuff. You're looking at airways and you're looking at needle decompression, uh, pelvic binders, all that sort of jazz. Whereas the basic life support and even you know uh, the the COTC, the T C. Um, if you look at the you know, viewers, if you look on deployedmed.com, you want to do a bit of learning about uh, T C. Mm -hmm. They have on there the uh, all servicemen, I think it's called now, or ASM. It's kind of that's the BLS level medical stuff for military for T C. And we were teaching that level to our guys overseas, and it it sort of went down to R. It was like massive bleeding airway you know head tilt chin lift chest seal and that was it mm. you know it didn't really worry about some of the other stuff he didn't even seal the box i don't think with yep. you know chest seals and things it was really gone back from march you know back down to the to, to bls and i think you know doctors abc is very easy for civilians to learn and for regular people to learn because it's been drummed into us so much mm. but we do need to have we do need to you know add in the m uh, it, it, it just needs to be there i mean mm. today that that incident unfortunately in the it, it's very easy to stab a major blood vessel yeah so someone unfortunately bleed out i was talking actually just at work the other day about um you know this massive hemorrhage and torn okay, and bleeding control and things and one of my colleagues is like oh well, why is that important i was like um Jeez. What, do you, what do you mean by what, what if you what if you're on the way home from work tonight you drive home and there's a vehicle accident and someone's got a traumatic amputation wouldn't it be nice yeah. to just fix that with a strap and a little stick thing i mean that, that's yeah. the sort of dogma we're trying to break up from medical professionals not really understanding the importance of massive bleeding and if medical professionals are not understanding it then how are we going to you know bash that into the heads of uh regular people yeah, I, I think it's one of the things that if we if we look at, you know, first day in general, uh, and I'm just going to call it out and just call it how it is, man, you know, when we look at who's been developing the courses, who's been looked at as subject matter ex experts and so on, um, there has been a massive miss uh, with regards to that massive hemorrhage. Uh, and, and one of the things I noticed that we, we have a lot of medical professionals who come through, uh, do the course, obviously, with PRACMED and stuff like that. Um, they think it's awesome, but there seems to be, you know, this real almost uh, disassociation from point of injury care, you know, with, with high echelons of med personnel who do the course and so on. I, you know, uh, there's, there's a few of the guys that come through who carry tourniquet and, you know, uh, you know, little IFAX or, you know, med kits, which are actually worth uh, anything. But when we look at who's actually been formulating the courses, man, this stuff is not new. You know, this has been, there's been evidence out there for the last 15 plus years in terms of what actually works with regards to point of injury care, why has it not been instituted with, you know, uh, first aid before we came along? Because we're the ones who really, you know, got this going, got the conversation starting, gripped it up, ran with it, and have really, really pushed it. And it all is all evidence-based. It's not just my opinion. It's not like I'm just turning around going, this is, you know, how we're going to do things because. And I, and I do wonder, I sit there and I do wonder whether it is because at the, uh, you know, at the clinical side, you know, when you get through to, uh, you know, your high-level care being uh, ED, um, and beyond, uh, or even you know, uh, as um, as early as paramedicine, uh, are we seeing people who literally uh, are literally picking up dead bodies who could have maybe survived before that? 
you know, because massive hemorrhage is something which is not covered. I mean, the anecdotes which come walking through my door, um, you know, and, and the, the classroom door are just, uh, they're incredible, you know, uh, guys who have, yeah. you know, what people bleed to death in front of them. And, you know, they, they it, it's, it's not exactly ones and twos, you know, it's it's well into the 30s now. Um, and we, we keep these stats. We, we go through and, you know, obviously passively keep these stats and whatnot. Absolutely incredible. So, you know, that, that massive hemorrhage, it's got to be there. Um, one thing I just want to bring back to as well, and we're going to talk about that doctors ABCD versus March, um, or just look at that again, is no matter which one you adopt, no matter which one you use, whether you're uh, BLS, whether you've never done a first aid course before, basic life support, you've never done a, a first aid course before, uh, or whether you know you've gone through you, you, you could be you know uh, spec ops medic or you know flight paramedic or whatever else it doesn't matter point of injury care comes down to a really really good primary survey and that is what wins the wars um you know we've, we've said a bit we've said this before we've got people who work for us who have you know very extensive backgrounds histories um and some amazing qualifications you know and steve obviously you have yours uh, when you look at doctors abc or march i mean there, there is no drug delivery in there um you know you if you Look at March, obviously there's uh, airway interventions if you want to go down that route, but legally here in New Zealand, I mean, what level can you go through and do if you're not uh, working? Me, head to a yep. turn left, MBA. <laughs> that's probably it. Yep. You know, that's, that's the sort of, you know, you're scratching right at the surface. You keep the air yep. going in, you keep the red stuff going around, that's it. I mean, that that that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you uh, keep the red stuff in, you keep air going around. Yeah, exactly. And it's the basics done well. And if we look at what we're getting at here, um, last time, uh, or the last Facebook Live we did, uh, we had Ed on board, uh, an absolutely amazing resource there, X18 Delta, um, or Special Operations uh, Medic from uh, the States, and we talked tourniquets. Um, and kind of reiterated the same thing, but it's the basics done really, really well, uh, which, which you know, makes such a huge outcome in terms of the chain of survival, going from the point of injury or the X, whatever you want to call it, all the way through, of course, into rehab and then uh, life if they if they uh, go through and survive. So when you when you look at that, doctors A B C D in March, what that is is a mnemonic, and it doesn't matter which one you use. It's, it's about going through, making sure you've got one there and making sure that you, you, you practice it, that you have it uh, written down somewhere. Hey, fridge, yeah. fridge magnet, you know, a uh, subtle plug there for the prac med. Um, but, you know, it's about going through and making sure that's squared away. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether you want to elaborate on that anymore, whether you've got anything else to put in on that. But um, for, for me, at least anyway, um, that is something which has helped me massively. Um, I've certainly found myself in positions, uh, twice I found myself in a real flat spin. You know, sitting there and just being completely overwhelmed by a situation, uh, and in both those instances, following system, following process, and guiding myself through is what got me through. And in one of those cases, it was revo uh, reverting back to the, to the March algorithm. So I don't know. Have you, have you ever found yourself in that situation? Or yeah, definitely. So even even just recently, even at, you know, recently here at work, um, I'm sitting at the computer doing up some notes and things, and suddenly the alarm bell starts ringing. And you're, oh, heck, what's going on? And notice that it's one of my rooms and that there's a family member standing at the end of the bed space, sort of, oh, you're like, oh, heck, better run in there, sort that out. And I get up at the end of the bed space. I'm thinking, uh, is there any danger in here? Whatever happens to the patient, I don't want to have happen to me. Responsiveness. Hello, hello, patient, can you hear me? Do mm. I need more help? You know, is the patient fitting? Are they in full cardiac arrest? Do I need mm. someone to get more help? Do I need this bystander to go and grab one of the doctors or my team member who is working with me to go and grab a doctor to help me out? And then it's into it. It's, are they pouring out with blood anywhere? No? Okay. Let's check airway. Is their airway open? Are they breathing? Yes, they are. Happy days. Most yeah, things are still covered there. Are they not breathing? Here we go. Straight into CPR. So mm. it's, it's really even, you know, I don't want to say that I'm an amazing, great guy and medical stuff, but in the ED working there, if, if someone crashes, I go into that, that doctor's M, A, B, C, D. I look at it, happen to them, don't want to have happen to me, responsiveness, do I need more help? So I'm getting other people, I'm doing the S, sitting for help, and then it's M, A, B, C, D. It, it, mm. It's, you know, at, at, at my great exalted level of registered nurse it's the same thing as bls on the street you know that's, <laughs> that's it that's that's it if you do the bls level right then when the got the fancy people get there it just makes it much much easier yeah 
That, that's exactly it, and that's something that I push really hard. Um, and I'm just noticing that we're having a few comments uh, pop up as well, uh, and it's really cool to see. There's a few in there. Um, uh, obviously, there's a few guys that you know, man. There's some uh, questionable comments in there about your Crocs. Uh, maybe you're wearing them, maybe you're not. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. You know, a few things I notice uh, that I that I know in there as well. And you know, guys have got some backgrounds on them. You know, blood goes around and around, and air goes in and out. Anything other is bad. Uh, Craig, you're absolutely on on the money that's, that's there. It. Um, yeah, and, 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 you know, good BLS saves lives every time. Absolutely. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, A, uh, make sure this, this is the absolute goal of what we do. Our mission is to make sure that QEs are empowered and obviously given uh, training and products to save real lives, legitimate real lives, not just the uh, clip in the tick compliance ones, um, but the legitimate ones. So, you know, that that's really important. But making sure that we make the paramedics jobs a little easier. You know, they don't want to show up and friggin', you know, have somebody who's, you know, deep into compensatory shock, you know, lost, you know, a liter, you know, a good liter and a half, two liters plus of blood and sitting there, you know, um, kind of all over the show. We want people who, you know, have the very, very best chance of survival. And that starts at X, man. And and for everybody who's listening out there, that's you. That could be you tomorrow, you know, driving to work, whatever else. I think you absolutely need, nailed it there, Steve-O. So yeah. um, what we're going to kind of do now is we're going to push on. And, and and I talked about this a little bit before, and somebody actually asked me about this uh, earlier this week when we posted it up. Um, there was some really, uh, really cool body cam footage which came out. Uh, forgive me uh, for not uh, knowing exactly which uh, PD state site it was from, um, but it was of a uh, resuscitation. Apparently it was successful, um, and... It was poolside resuscitation of a, a, a drowning victim. And I think this is a really, really good video to go through breakdown. Uh, we can talk about uh, a little around the DRS, ABCD side of the house, but also um, we're going to talk now a little more about um, what is going on inside of that box, specifically around the heart and the lungs, um, and, and, and talk a little bit about that, why we do CPR and whatnot. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this video up. Um, for those of you who are watching out there live, this video um, is obviously really Real life, the faces are blurred uh, of the victim casualty, um, and yeah, it is uh, for some people. It may be a little distressing. Uh, there's no blood and gore, but of course, you know, uh, trauma is trauma, and you know these things uh, sometimes can kind of trigger people. So just a bit of a warning there. So I'm going to bring this video up anyway. Um, we're going to go through watch it. It's around about 60 seconds long, uh, and then we are going to go through and break it down uh, the good points, the bad points, and the ugly points. So yeah, anyway, sideline critics, um, stand by. Let's uh, go ahead and play this video. Let me have you guys back up for me, okay? We're going to have the fire department get in here in a second, okay? Can I get you back up for me, You want this off? It's wet. Just leave it on here. Turn it on. Turn it on. Turn it on. Stay clear, clear. of patient. Stay clear. Analyzing heart rhythm. Sonia! No, 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 no. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing heart rhythm. No shot advised. Be sure. Okay, so pretty intense video there, team. Um, that was obviously uh, kind of lately, um, earlier this week. Um, and you have there, obviously, a, a young drowning victim. Um, unfortunately, this is something uh, in here in New Zealand, which is one of the number one uh, causes of mortality, uh, particularly for uh, zero through to four-year-olds, if I'm not wrong with those stats, um, and airway obstruction, of course, as well. Um, when we look at something like this, there's a lot of emotion involved, uh, and there's some really, really, really good drills uh, which are obviously deployed there. So, um, in, t in terms of the in terms of the danger side of the house, obviously, uh, you know, you, you're you're in a bit of a situation. You've got the pool going on there. You've got family members around. You know, uh, distressed mother or distressed relative by the looks of things as well, um, and and obviously a few things to kind of manage there. Um, when, when we refer back through it, you know, um, pe people get wrapped up and get a little kind of, you know, jumpy about the, the algorithms and think it's a bit too much to look at. But a lot of this stuff kind of comes intrinsically. Dangers covered. Guys go in, you know, get it squared away, introduce themselves. Obviously, there's a couple other police there. This is the the guys with the defrib and uh, BVM who are, you know, coming through to, to attend resus. 
Um, yeah, um, response. There wasn't really much of a, uh, you know, they didn't go through and try and obviously check response. I think it's fairly obvious as to what's going on. Um, yeah. The kid is very, very limp. And this is one thing which is very, very difficult to, to replicate, uh, you know, on basic life support courses is getting that buy-in or understanding um, of people going through and saying, hey, you know, this, this is a body, but, you know, maybe there's something else going on here. We, we know what's going on. We can see the mechanism and injury is clear. The, the casualty, the victim is very much um, not not in an alert state whatsoever. Uh, and yeah, they just pretty much get straight into the into the CPR side of the house. Was, was there anything that you kind of saw in that phase or that initial phase, the DRS kind of phase, that's kind of um, that, that, that you'd like to kind of cover and talk about, Steve-O? Yeah, so I think actually those guys are, were very slick with their, with their drills. I mean, they, they rock up, they go straight in, take over the scene, get the family kind of corralled to the side, mostly, I'll cover in a sec. And then mm. you see a clip there where someone whips out a towel and starts drying the kid off, which that is part awesome. of your danger stuff because you don't want to defibrillate wet people. You don't want to be doing it on a wet surface because, you know, we're going to talk about this a bit more, talk about defibrillation, but that mm. is a you know, massive capacitor that's going to fire a big electric shock through that kid, you know. So you want to make sure that they're nice and dry. So that's part of the danger thing they're looking at there. Response, you clearly got a floppy kid. I mean, you walk into a pool, there's someone, you know, that's zonked out, soaking wet, not breathing. You can assume what's going on there. So checking for response, yeah. If you walk up and you start to touch someone, they're probably going to start to respond if, they, if they're not completely, you know, out and they need uh, they need help. And send for help. We can hear more sirens in the background. The dispatch has obviously dispatched those cops there, so they must know something about the scene. So you can assume that uh, a rig, um, an ambulance is on the way and they're going to be looking at more airway stuff and working out why that defib is saying no shock advised. Yeah, so I think the DRS guys really slick. They obviously have a, a version of uh, Pragmed over there, which has given some pretty good training. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> 100%, man. I, I, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree. And it's one thing which, you know, it's not it's not just necessarily about the danger of obviously sending the shock through, but also, you know, getting a really good connection uh, of the pads through. And it's something which is, you know, overlooked so often with regards to, you know, wiping away, not just from, uh, you know, pulling somebody out of a pool, but also, you know, the buildup of, you know, the sweat, you know, the cardiogenic uh, shock obviously induces a, or a, a causes a sweat, um, which needs to be wiped away for, for the pads to get its optimum connection down onto the skin. You know, yeah. um, those drills there were just epic. Yeah. One of the other things they've done is they've obviously realized that the size of the patient is not going to work with the pad size they've got. So they've mm. gone anterior, posterior. You know, on an adult, you put the pads so you know, here and here, so it's going to go across. But with that kid, it's going to go from the front straight through to the back. So th those cops are, are really well drilled. They don't have little kid pads. They've got adult pads, and they know to go front and back. That, that's really good. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic as well. You know, um, just absolutely epic uh, from the, the side of the house, you know, going through and doing those drills. Um, a little bit uh, shady with the BVM there, and that's something you see as well. Uh, yeah, it's a bit weird there. there. There's a few tricks and tips you can kind of use with that, you know, obviously covering the um, covering the mask up or covering the, the valve up and, and going through and squeezing off a couple of times. But, hey, you know, that's minor stuff. And it's really one thing as well that we need to kind of acknowledge here is it's so easy to sit there and talk about this stuff and be a sideline critic. Uh, oh, yeah, it's, easy to, it's easy to crap on them from a thousand miles away. Has oh, everything yeah. been flawless? Oh, bro, you, you're kidding yourself. You know, absolutely taking the piss. So, yeah, no, that was, that was absolutely fantastic. So, you know, when, when we go through, um, you know, and, and look at the way that it was handled and stuff, um, there was another uh, aspect of the video, um, and it comes back to the danger side of the house. When you have a super emotional relative, and, and you know, that's understandable. Um, when when you, you, you don't want any, you don't want unnecessary communication or clutter, you know, voice clutter in, a, in an emergency situation. That That is just, you know, when the radio is going crazy or anything like that, that is just the worst case scenario. You want only necessary comms. That's it. You know, keep it simple, stupid. Once again, we go back to the basics. Um, but, you know, when you have a relative who's starting to get upset, she's calling the kid's name, uh, trying to touch her and stuff like that, which is something, um, you know, and, and this varies from culture to culture. It's something I saw, you know, in some of the countries that I worked at um, or worked in and so on as well. Um, you know, different cultures have different kind of uh, ways of dealing with this stuff. And, for um for this one here, I think they dealt with it absolutely perfectly. Um and yep. you know, we're yeah, very, very aware of these situations. So yeah, kind of moving her away. Um the last thing you want is somebody jumping all over a um casualty or, or covering their body 
Um, you know, depending on what kind of defibrillator you're using, I mean, most of them are semi-automatic. That uh, we we only use semi-automatic defibrillators, uh, stock them and sell them. But um, you know, you do have fully automatic defibrillators, and they don't care. You know, if you're sitting yeah, on no. top of them, give a shit. So that's a worry <laughs> when that when, they, when she comes in. It's like oh oh, you know. yeah. 100%. And we've got a video issue of somebody getting shocked um, by, accidentally by an AED. Um, I've never oh, seen yeah, it. Yeah, it's in hospital. yeah, that's uh, not a good place to be. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, uh, I've, I've had a few experiences with um, other forms of electricity, but um, certainly not a defibrillator, you know, on myself at least. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those things we want to avoid. So, yeah, really, really well done uh, to, to that PD there. So, when, yeah. when uh, let's get a bit of a heads up, man. Um, you know, let, let's let's talk about some of the common reasons why 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 would why would somebody why would a defib say no shock advised and and what do you think we should do? Like, if I'm sitting there over this, yeah. bed, you know, what he thinks AD is going to fix everything, and then turns around and goes no shock advised, and I'm sitting there like this kid looks dead. Why? 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 Yeah. Could that be, man? Why do you reckon that's a okay. This is probably the first video I've seen, of, you know, from from you know, live legal body cam and that, where the defib actually says no shock advised, and I, I was surprised the first time I saw it when it said that. I was like, oh heck, you know, here we go. So mm. that is essentially what what it's telling you is that the defibr the defibrillator it is reading the electrical activity of the heart, right? So you know, your heart is this muscle which is controlled by electricity. Impulse is generated, it causes your heart, the top of your heart to beat, the bottom of your heart to beat, like this. Mm. And then the defibrillator can read that signal. It can read what that looks like on a screen, an ECG output. And the defibrillator is trained to look for two things. It's trained to look for ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. And if it recognizes those, so that's the bottom of the heart beating too hard and too fast, and it's the whole heart sort of just jiggling like this. And it looks very different electrically. And the defibrillator can read that. And if it sees anything other than that, it's going to say no shock advised. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, when, when we talk about that a little bit, I think this is a really good opportunity to go through uh, and bring up a couple of the photos we've got online here as well. So the first one I'm going to bring up um, so everybody understands, we'll, we'll, um, before we actually go through this, let's talk about the purpose of CPR. And, and what we're actually trying to achieve with it. So when, when we go through uh, and, and deliver CPR to somebody, obviously, as Steve has just brought up, um, an absolutely great explanation there. Um, but for those of us who maybe don't have, you know, uh, a real kind of in-depth background, what we're trying to do is push blood around the body. Because as Steve said, you know, maybe the bottom of the heart or the top of the heart isn't working quite, quite in sync or in rhythm. And obviously, if that's not happening, that is simply a pump pushing blood around the body. Now, if I bring up this diagram here, um, you can quite clearly see, um, you know, th this is essentially what's going on with regards to um, blood being forced out of the heart um, into the various different tissues, into the capillaries um, and, and, and all the different tissues within the body um, and then being returned back through uh, the veins, back into the heart, into the lungs, um, going through the gas exchange process, then, of course, uh, being brought back uh, into the heart as arterial uh, or oxygenated blood to get forced into the arteries. Now, when we when we talk about that, when we talk about uh, what's happening with CPR, why, why in your thoughts, why, why do you think, Steve-O, why is CPR so important? Or, or what, what do you think the key aspects of CPR are uh, for a basic life support operator? Yeah, so the thing you need to realize is when you're doing CPR, all you're doing is squashing the heart between the sternum and the, and the spine and causing that blood to be ejected. You know, you're squeezing the blood out of the heart, out of the, the oh, out, yeah, out of the ventricles, up to the lungs. And then if you're also giving the rescue breaths, you're causing some gas exchange, some oxygen's going in, some carbon dioxide is coming out, and then that that blood is then going back into the heart, and you're pumping, your your pumping action is gonna push that out around to the body's tissues, up to the brain, which is important because you want to. You know, keep the brain with a good well supply, uh, a good supply of well oxygenated blood, which is going to stop hypoxic or low oxygen brain injury, which is going to yeah. determine whether you come out of it on a ventilator and get up and go home or you don't get up. And also what you're doing is maintaining perfusion or blood supply, well oxygenated blood supply to the cardiac, to the heart muscle itself. So your heart is a muscle, of course, and it needs blood supply. Some of that blood seeps out from in the chambers out into the heart muscle, 
but the heart also has arteries of its own and you need to put well oxygenated blood through those arteries into the heart muscle so that when you get the defibrillator and you shock it, it's got more chance of, you know, of restarting, coming back online after the defibrillation knocks it out, SA node fires up and bang, you've got a beating heart again. So when you, yeah, the way that works, you, you do compressions, the blood goes out, it goes into the coronary arteries, the heart arteries, well genetic blood makes the heart muscle nice and juicy, ready for defibrillation, perfect environment, you shock it, the heart stops. By the way, if you don't know that, when you defibrillate, the heart stops, and then you wait for the sinoatrial node, a bunch of heart muscle to click back on. 100%. Yeah, so, your heart again. yeah, 100%. So for those of you who are kind of watching, you maybe uh, don't quite understand what's going on here. When we talk about the um, the SA node or the sinoatrial node, um, that is the one up the top there. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer kind of uh, swirling around it. Um, but if you look up the top there, that's a sinoatrial uh, node there. Um, and, and, and if you want to kind of walk us through this diagram, Steve, and kind of talk about what actually is happening here. Yeah, no worries. So... What we have here, picture of a heart. Blue side primarily is what's supposed to be deoxygenated blood. The red side is the oxygenated blood. Uh, so this is kind of the way the conduction pathway or the way the heart works, right? So up the top there, you have the SA node, the sinoatrial node. The little notation on the side, 60 to 100 beats per minute, you may know is the average resting heart rate, right? So the SA node, it depolarizes, starts an impulse, 60 to 100 times a minute. That impulse depolarizes, tells the atriums, which are the top bits of the heart, they squeeze the blood down to the bottom parts of the heart. Right? That's the way the heart sort of works, squeezes that blood down. So what your impulse comes from the SA node, it goes to what's called the anterior ventricular node, the AV node, and it pauses very briefly there to allow that blood to come down from the atriums into the ventricles. If for some reason your SA node is not firing, then the AV node takes over the work, starts to do the mahi, and you get 40 to 60 beats a minute. All right. So after it goes through the AV node, we come down and you get to what's called the bundle of his, and that's where it sort of breaks away into the left and the right bundle branches. And this is the way that the impulse sort of goes down the heart and across the ventricles, the lower parts of the heart, the big juicy bits that squeeze the blood out into the lungs and into the body. Below that, you'll see there, Purkinje fibers, that's like the last, almost last ditch effort. After that, you're down to the cardiac cells themselves trying to depolarize and mm. cause a beat, and that's when you are essentially toast after that. Yeah, 100%. I, I think for a lot of people, that may seem like really big brain stuff. Um, but I think it's really, really, really important to understand. Um, one, one of the things that I've heard on a number of occasions is people walking into the class on a basic life support course and, and giving anecdotes of, hey, you know, um, the, the guy was, you know, we, we had one of our workers who was walking through the yard early this morning, you know, got to work at four or five o'clock in the morning and, you know, and, and he fell over and he was dead before he hit the ground. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, who, what gives you the right to say whether he's dead or not, man? You know, uh, you because he looks like they're completely out to it. I mean, we saw just before in that video, I mean, that, that kid, um, you know, if, if you don't know what you're looking at, if you've never seen a body before or, or never seen somebody go through the process of death uh, or anything like that, then, then yeah, okay, I get it. But this is why we bring this topic out into the sunlight. Um, this is something which needs to be exposed, talked about a little bit more and normalized, of course, as well. So, you know, when when when, when you're sitting there and you're, you know, um, maybe, maybe sitting there and the SA node's not firing right, the AV node is processing down to the AV node's not going right, uh, and then we're, what and the per perijunky fibers uh, aren't obviously going for it, uh, or maybe the heart's relying on that and sitting there fluttering around in a state of VT, um, obviously that person is not going to look, or ventricular tachycardia, that person is not going to look like they're alive. They're going to look like they're dead, dead. Um, however, that is absolutely not for us to decide at a basic life support level. Um, I certainly won't, um, you know, if, if somebody's just collapsed or whatever else, 
um, you know, we need to go through, see whether they're breathing. If they're not breathing, you know, if we've made that assessment, we know they're not breathing, then we just start CPR. And, you know, this could be one of those times, I guess, that we're looking at, you know, um, obviously, you know, the defib goes on, but it could be one of those opportunities that, you know, we miss, um, you know, may, maybe the heart is functioning, you know, maybe it's a case of an issue with regards to the lungs themselves. Um, who knows, you know. Um, so with, with regards to, you know, what you've found uh, working in ED and, you know, your experience over the, you know, decade and a half plus, two decades close to, I guess, um, of, you know, operating around the globe and, of course, in the NZDF, um, I, I think there's a point here we need to talk about the really distinct difference between uh, CPR or, or the reasons why. Um, and this is something which kind of... Uh, I took for granted for a long time that people would just understand, I guess, uh, glossed over it or simply didn't touch it. Um, and, and it was something that you broke down extremely well earlier. Uh, and that was obviously going through and uh, understanding, you know, why why would a kid maybe fall over or why why do kids uh, have cardiac issues or require, rather, why do kids require CPR versus adults? Do you, do you want to talk about that at all? Do you want to kind of elaborate in, into that a little? Yeah, yeah. So, so what what we can what we can say is that generally, generally, when adults have cardiac arrest, it is more likely to be because of heart issues. You know, a cardiovascular something's wrong with the heart structurally or electrically, and that's what's causing that heart attack. It's the heart, the pump. Mm. When it comes to kids, they generally you have to be very general on this generally they've not been eating too much kfc and haven't been smoking too many ciggies and watching too much tv that they've got heart issues it's usually with children not a cardiovascular issue that they're having a heart attack or having a cardiac arrest with kids it's almost always because of a respiratory issue it's usually mm. are they choking or they've drowned so when it comes to kids, you slap the AED on. It may recognize, you know, that there is what's called pulseless electrical activity. That means essentially the electrical system of the heart, like I've just described the SA node, AV node, all that jazz. As far as the AED knows, that is still working. What's happening, though, is the cardiac muscle is not pumping because it doesn't have any oxygen. So mm. this AED says no shock advice because there's no, you don't shock a normal rhythm. You don't If it, the system is working, you don't shock that. And how can you fix it? You give oxygen. Yeah. So that's why that, that AED, it's hard to tell. We can't really tell in this scenario. There, also, there's another reason. Maybe that kid doesn't need a shock because it has a pulse. You can mm. presume that those policemen check for a pulse, but, you know, they, it's a high-stress environment that looks like there's a dead kid there, so you might miss it. So it might be saying, no shock advice, because you don't need to do one. You just need to do some breaths. But mm. with kids, so we were talking about that, that bag mask, perfect, perfect to deliver those breaths. You know, so with kids, it's almost always a respiratory issue. You give those breaths, do a bit of CPR, some chest compressions, they'll start vomiting. If you clear the airway, give some more breaths, and they'll pop back up. Yeah. Usually, yeah, I, can't I, say I, this all the time, brownie, of course, but yeah, yeah, kids almost always it's a respiratory issue instead of cardiovascular disease, which causes them to have a rest. Yeah, I, I think it's a really, really important thing to um, obviously address and look at as well. Um, you know, when, when we're dealing with this, um, you know, it's super subjective, and by no means are you going to get lucky every single time, you know, um, with regards to the time under water, um, you know, what's actually caused it, is there a spinal injury involved as well, um, there's so many factors when it comes to, you know, uh, water, or, with, with drownings and so on, which are just ridiculous, um, but, you know, it, you, you, you've just got to try, you don't need to think about that, you just need to try, you, you know, try. That, that's that's the message that, you know, what? As well. just look, oh, 100%, 100 um, even if it is, you know, you know, even if it seems that all hope is lost or whatever else, you know, you've, you've got to try. You know, um, it is absolutely, uh, this is what I was getting to before as well with the uh, few anecdotes I've had, people coming on, you know, so-and-so uh, -so fell over in the yard and was dead before we hit the ground. No, no, no we, 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 don't, we don't get to do that, man. You know, we're, we're not judge, jury, and execution around this place. You know, we don't, we don't play God in that sense. We go through and we work on this person. It's that simple. 
that, that's it. And again, you know, those situations, you've, you've said it before as well, just before, and I'm going to revert back to this, it is a high stress thing. It, it really is. You know, it is never a good thing to be dealing with somebody who's in a shit way and a bad way in front of you and taking on that deep breath and reverting back through to uh, the mental tools that we offered people kind of covered earlier in the uh, in the in the live broadcast tonight around doctors, ABCD and or the March algorithm, depending on what you want to use. Those are just insanely useful, insanely useful, because you know what, you know, um, you know, uh, everybody thinks they're good to go. Everybody thinks they're good to go until you really? face it kind of stuff and man you know uh we've got some awesome awesome training which is going to be uh obviously all that training is awesome but we have some even more awesome training uh which is going to come through and an event maybe as well maybe an Ooh. event which, um which might really kind of push people uh to go through and um you know see what they've really got um which which we've got on on the on the cards as well so you know it's there but if you revert back to that drs danger take that deep breath manage the dangers that happened to the it could happen to me. You know, check for that response. Send for help straight away. That takes like 20 seconds if that. Well, you yeah. know, in an ideal world, you know, running through your process, you know, you, you've got to deal with what you do and you won't always be able to get in there. Um, I've had a situation before when, um, you know, going through and trying to get a couple of guys out of a um, uh, 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 of a of a situation and one of them we couldn't get out. Simple as that. And it was, it, it sucked. It's never a good thing to see. Uh, but yeah, there's um, there's been times where, you know, you've just got to keep rolling. You know, there's um, there's there's no, there's no, you know, it's just simply too dangerous, or it's literally impossible to 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 retrieve somebody uh, to even begin working on them. So that's something I want people to think about as well. Don't be, don't ever be too hard on yourself if you have gone through these kind of situations as well. Um, yeah, so that that's that's really 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 good, man. Um, with regards to the uh, regards to the CPR side of the house, regards to why we need to do it, uh, and also the rescue breathing, I think is important. And we might just touch on that very very briefly in terms of pulmonary stimulation or, or the stimulation of the lungs. Um, do, do do you think that has much of an effect, or do you think that has um, you know much much of a uh, how to put it? <laughs> Yeah, it has much of an effect in the in the outcome of, of uh, in particular, let's talk drowning uh, cares here. What, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, definitely for drowning, all, all the evidence says you, breaths. Yeah, we have this, we have this, I'll slightly touch on uh, the idea of hands only or compressions only CPR. In drowning, mm. throw it out. It, it doesn't, it, no, it's gone. Because mm. that person has been immersed in water, you know, nose and mouth underwater no oxygen they're hypoxic they need the oxygen going in they need you to do the breaths compressions only cpr works because you, know, you have that reserve or four to five minutes four minutes of oxygen in your blood at all times so you have the defibrillator on after that you know every one minute is a 10 percent chance more of dying and after five minutes you're below 50 percent. you know so but with drowning, that you're, you're starting from a deficit already. They're already deoxygenated, hypoxic. You need to do the breaths. You know, compressions, mm. great. Do the compressions. You know, you might just have to nut up and suck face with that stranger and save their life. Now, mm. If it's your own kid, of course, you're going to be going mouth to mouth. If it's, mm. I, I sort of say, if it's someone you would normally kiss or suck face with, mouth to mouth, go for it. But yeah. you know, if, if you've got a bit of bit of foam around the mouth at some weird, some random stranger, you might just have to you know go mouth to mouth to save their life because compressions only is not going to. I can't say definite. It's not going to yeah. be as effective in drowning. Yeah. So it, for drowning, brisky breaths. Yeah. Compressions. I think that brings up a really, really good point. Um, you know, in, in terms of my very, very limited experience with dealing uh, with resus and so on, um, it's it's an ugly picture to paint, man. You know, um, with stuff coming up out of the mouth and all that kind of stuff, it's it's all good. You know, doing first aid course and being like, oh, you got to give two rescue breaths or whatever else. But you know, when you got stomach contents, you know, when you got saliva in terms of the foam, and when you got sometimes blood and stuff, you know, coming up out of the mouth, um, I think. Something which is so important to look at, including uh, with your defibrillator, is you know a facial mask. You know, um, if, if it's not a BVM, I don't expect no people 
around with BVMs uh, or bag valve masks. Um, that is a piece of kit which um, you know does actually require a little bit of training on and can be counterproductive uh, and quite dangerous as well. But with regards to a legitimate face mask, we I mean we sell them. They're not actually that expensive. Like I, I don't know how much they are. They're definitely like around twenty dollars or less. Surely um, I have to check on that. Don't quote me. <laughs> um, but you know, that's true. That, that is that is a piece of equipment that we can you know go through there's actually no physical contact with the lips and that is one of the things as well it is actually remarkably difficult to get a really good positive seal uh with mouth to mouth and we see this time and time out with the bls courses uh with regards to people putting their mouths on a on a you know recess any dummy uh and just failing to go through and get that with the rescue masks that you have those literally do 90 percent of the work for you all you have to do is place it over the patient's face, go through, and then from there, the, the rest is obviously just breathing in, not too quick, just breathing in as you normally would. And the chances of overinflation, unless you're dealing with a smaller uh, patient, is actually going to be, you know, relatively, uh, you know, you, you, it's, it's it's pretty pretty low. Uh, as opposed to using, you know, 1.5 litre BVM or something like that uh, on, on on a child or even an adult, you know, understanding the, the tidal volumes and so on of, of the lung capacity. So, yeah, definitely, um, if you haven't ever considered that, if you haven't looked at that, that's something you probably should. Maybe uh, we'll, we'll have a look at those. Uh, I don't think I can spend an hour talking about um, a face mask. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a pretty dry conversation, I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can go through and do a short clip sometime. I don't know when I'm down in your hood, um, and, and go through and, and talk about the use of a face mask uh, as opposed to uh, these these almost virtue signalling uh, face shields which are running around the place. Which personally, I, I think are fairly ridiculous. Um, but you know, if you've got one, make sure you've trained and have used the one that you are carrying, like any piece of equipment out there. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just just look at the functionality. It's all good carrying kit. But if you've got all the gears and no ideas, um, that's going to leave you flustering. Uh, and again, yeah. it's coming back to that DRS ABCD. So we have um, we have a, 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 a you know a, a period at the end as well, and we're coming up in fifty five minutes now. It's incredible how time flies and stuff. And and thank you so much, oh, Steve. Wow. Amazing job of answering the questions, uh, kind of going through here, um, you know, and, and discussing this topic. It is absolutely awesome to have somebody with your experience on board. Um, uh, we have an. <laughs> Hope you aren't wearing Crocs, Steve. Okay, gosh. Um, we, we have a... Um, somebody obviously knows you. Um, we, we have an opportunity at the end here, just as we did last time with Ed, uh, for people to go through and ask questions. And just before we go through this, what I want to address is one of the questions which was asked from the last segment. Um, yeah, it's a little off topic with tonight's discussion, but it's around the use of tourniquet for a fracture, a uh, closed fracture of a femur uh, with suspected uh, long bone bleed, long bone bleed. Um, and, and for me... Uh, I went through and, and, and I answered the question and then we had uh, Ed who was uh, on, he, he popped up and answered the question as well. But I just want to go out there and talk about this with the viewers as well. So obviously, completely condone this. However, when we're talking about femur fracture, uh, maybe you can elaborate on this as well, Steve. Um, I, I don't know. Um, with, with regards to femur fracture, obviously, it's incredibly painful. I haven't seen too many people kind of just kind of shake it off and be kind of cool with it, you know, um, unless they're really, really, really in a bad way um, and low level consciousness to the max. But with regards to that, if you do have a closed fracture uh, femur and you're obviously seeing uh, some buildup of fluid in that area, you, you, you're on point, man. You've done a really good job because you know what? Um, that's something that takes some time uh, and it certainly takes some experience to look at. Um, but ultimately, if, the, if there's a suspicion of it, if the person looks like they're kind of uh, dropping into hypovolemic shock uh, in terms of losing blood and there's no obvious uh, kind of uh, penetrating traumas or there's nothing else which is obvious, then yeah, go hard, you know, of course. Yeah. You know, use of pre hospital tourniquet on something where you think there's maybe a femoral artery which has been, um, you know, uh, which is which has been nicked inside, inside and there's bleeding into that compartment, then why not? I don't know. What, what do you think about that, Steve? Have you heard yeah, anything? Man, 100%. Like 100%. You, you definitely would do it. I mean, if you've got a blood volume of five liters, you know, average average person, uh, and you can bleed up to two liters into that long bone cavity, that's a mm. fairly hefty portion of your blood volume that is outside your circulation, inside your body. It, it's not, it's not going to be on the floor, but it's not going to be doing you any good. So yeah, if you if you got that external rotation and shortening, you suspect a femur fracture, fracture, and you got a swollen limb, definitely whack a tourniquet on. I had an instance of this. Uh, well, not, it wasn't a fracture. A patient had undergone a uh, uh, ablation. So they, they medically, they'd accessed the femoral artery, 
and they and you know, put a camera or some sort of jazz up there, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But they had pain and swelling at the at the site of the femoral artery, and it was like, okay, cool. Well, we're going to have to put a tourniquet on that. And the paramedics at that time were like, well, what, what are you doing, man? Like, why do you need a tourniquet? This is a femoral mm. artery bleed. Of course, I need a tourniquet. What are you talking yep. about? That, that that's that's a, yeah, if it's internal, external, it's an artery bleed. I mean, the femoral artery is like the size of a finger. You think mm. how much blood can pour out of that? It's it, it's no brainer. Yeah, definitely go for it. Yeah, hundred percent. I think you know a really good point there. And this is just so, this is a reiteration. Just because the blood isn't leaking outside the body doesn't mean that it's still in circulation. With with a cold bleeding or, or bleeding inside of the body under the skin tissue, obviously, um, you know that, that that is no longer in circulation. That is a medical emergency, and that needs to be dealt with ASAP. Um, you know, it's it's not a case of sitting there and kind of humming and hiring about things. That that is like let's go. Okay, let's let's get this dude out of here. Either figure out a plan in terms of evacuation. Um, that's best case, uh, particularly you know, around femoral break, uh, femur breaks because, you know, they are extremely painful and the last thing you want to do is obviously put the, the cares under stress, get their heart rate up and, and just ex exacerbate the problem. So, yeah, that's um, that, that's absolutely massive, um, you know, just just absolutely crazy uh, that, that these are, you know, things that people are looking at and, and kind of wondering why. And I think, you know, uh, I understand that the, the, there is cat tourniquets which are issued uh, definitely to the police now, which is awesome. I don't know about the, um, the yeah, ambulance. The other day. Sorry? Sorry, a, a cop was in the department the other day with a tourniquet. In my opinion, he had a bit of a weird place. It was kind of up, up, way up here in his armour in a pouch, and like not not in an actual pouch, kind of tucked in. I don't know. I don't know how he's going to do it, but yeah, a, a bit awkward to try and pull out, I think. But I don't know. Maybe he practiced with it. Maybe he was great with it, but looked a bit weird. Yeah. Look, I'm just going to throw I'm just going to throw this out there because you know it's the same thing with me. Um, just on the topic of tourniquet or, or IFAC or IFAS, um, you know, medical equipment placement. Um, you know, when, when it comes to going through and placing equipment at a ta on from a tactical perspective or any perspective, um, if you have to carry an IFAC or a, you know a TQ, it needs to be uniformed. Uh, and if, if 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 your department, if your unit is worth shit, I'm just going to put it bluntly then you're going to have that squared weight. I don't care about magazine pouches. I don't care about your water bottle or your, your frigging E&E &E pouch or where you're going to stash your, your nods or whatever else. But the one thing that you need squared away is your med pouch. And that is because when when the pressure is on, when you're in that environment, when, when somebody you know is hurt, hurt, whatever else, that, that tourniquet, you're having to pull that off them and deploy it on them. You've got to keep yours for you. That is so important. And if you don't have that uniform, when things go down, when you're losing that fine motor skills and all the rest of it, Everything's going to happen, you know. Sit there and roll your eyes at it, you know. It's going to be one of these things where you're just going to simply fail. So, you know that that is so important. And uh, you know, again, uh, we've covered this topic a number of times, but unfortunately, uh, so far that I've, I've counted three, uh, you know, police officers out there on the on the on the beat who are carrying their tourniquets inside their packets, uh, and that is something which for me is just completely unacceptable. Uh, we've gone through, we've proven how slower uh, or how much more time it takes. And, and that is in a non-stress, uh, non-threatened uh, environment where you've got all the time in the world and every every opportunity to open up the TQ. The packet doesn't do anything. It doesn't keep it sterile. It doesn't keep it clean. It's just there to show it's an OEM product. product. For all of you out there, for any of the police, or if you've got police friends, tell them to pull their damn tourniquet out of the packet. Okay? We've got, yeah, we've, got, uh, this, that's bad. <laughs> we've got everything sitting in there to go through and to go go through and check your tourniquets. We literally have a checklist to go through and check the serviceability. It's all good having the gears, guys, but without the ideas, it's worthless. Okay. So well, um, I've got yeah. one about the, there's a quick point about tourniquet placement for the guys who think you're high speed. I, I tried the old uh, you know, operator AF, putting it in the old uh, the, 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 the pocket up here with the strap stuck to the Velcro on the outside. Yep. Yeah. If you do that, just, just, Try and get it out and put it on yourself. I mean, just just think about how quick you need to get it on, and try accessing it from that pouch. Um, I think you might be surprised at how difficult it can be. Yeah, one hundred one hundred percent, man. Um, you know, just because you've seen some high speed dude or some high speed dude do it on a movie or do it on a on a Facebook post doesn't mean it works. You know, um, and, and we covered this with uh, Ed. Uh, the other week and stuff like that, um, you know, is just a, such an important topic. And look, I could talk about this all day. I really could. Um, and I, I'm sure we'll cover it later on as well. Yeah. Whether it's yeah. going through, um, it is, uh, yeah, it is, it is absolutely, um, absolutely a topic that we'll cover off on. I, I, I just don't think that there is any 
way that I can really quantify or uh, uh, put into, you know, I, I can't overstate the importance of those basic drills. I just can't. You know, um, I've seen the results, and I'm sure you have, in fact, I know you have, Steve, um, seen the results of when basics are done very well and when basics are simply not done well at all. And it's, it's, it's night and day, man. It's night and day. So, look, uh, you know, there's another part of this as well, team, out there. For all of you uh, kind of watching, listening, uh, and whatnot, it's, it's, it's about what if, what if it's me? You know, what if it's my family? What if it's my kid, uh, you know, very, very soon to be born? <laughs> um, and what if it's my partner? You know, what, what if they're, they're sitting there and they're bleeding to death? I want them to have the very best opportunity to survive. What if, what if it's you, Steve? You know, it's it's like, okay. Uh, I can't exactly go. Mean, Somebody else better. Yeah, people out there, you know, if you're going to be treating me, I need you to be squared away. <laughs> Come on and ask me about it if you want to learn how to use tourniquets. You know, we, we need to be squared away on this. We need to be slick and fast on this. Yeah, 100%. Man. It's, um, it's funny which you're having to deploy um, and it is awesome to see uh, police carrying them on them and stuff like that. I think this is fantastic. Uh, way overdue, but it is fantastic they've uh, finally got those on their rigs. Um, that you need you need to have your drill squared away with that stuff. Um, simple as that. And don't use your real live tourniquets, like your deployment ones, um, as as training tools as well. Um, they can take a beating, but you don't want that thing failing on you. Um, team, I think we've gone just over that one hour mark to 104, 105 coming uh, up in 30 seconds. Um, look, Probably should have said it at the start. Um, it would be awesome if we had some questions getting fired through and stuff like that. Feel free to shoot. Uh, feel free to shoot through any questions that you do have, or maybe you thought of during this episode, or maybe even that you think about later on. Comment in the thread section below. This will go up as a um, Facebook post uh, straight after we go uh, and finish up the live, um, the live thing here, uh, the live broadcast here. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about this, then um, please go ahead and just get back at us. Um, for those of you who are out there, um, we are going to go through and have another one of these chats, uh, probably middle to the end of next month. Obviously, uh, as I alluded to just before, I have a whole new adventure that I'm about to embark on. Uh, and so things might get a little crazy around here. So um, I'm just going to figure out what normal looks like, first of all, and then we'll launch um, another live uh, middle of next month, I think, middle to the end of next month. And we've already kind of sussed a topic out that we're going to be talking about there. We're going to be talking about burns. And this is one that you should tune into. It doesn't matter whether you've never done a first aid course before. It doesn't matter whether you've uh, done, you know, uh, anything like that. We have an incredibly uh, knowledgeable guest who's going to be joining us for that uh, and giving us the rundown on burns, what to do, what not to do, uh, and, you know, go through. For me, this is something which I look at as being a, an incredibly – important topic because if we look at what's going on around the place it is so hard to manage um you know and and, and of course you know steve i'm sure you kind of understand this as well everything from you know natural disaster like what we had happen on white island just off the coast from where i stay um right through to you know conflict zones with ieds they cause freaking absolute chaos burns you know um you know it, it is just absolutely nightmarish stuff something which is so hard to deal with we're going to get into the nitty gritty of it and uh, really, really boil it down. Uh, no pun intended there. And um, yeah, I'm just having a look here. We've had a few comments kind of pop up, and um, yeah, there's there's some kind of uh, comments supporting what we've kind of talked about here as well. Um, you know, in regards to the training and whatnot of uh, tourniquets and whatnot. Um, I think people just need to swallow a little bit, of, eat a little bit of humble pie, um, and just get on board, man. You know, uh, we need yeah. training for which actually train the stuff properly. We are most definitely the premier training uh, academy, how would you put it, training company in New Zealand for delivering uh, training with Tourniquet. And I'm just going to throw it out there as well. Uh, you might actually see Steve a little more often because uh, occasionally Steve picks up a, a, a course or two and comes through and kind of delivers his knowledge through to the masses with practice as a contract trainer. Um, so yeah, he's um, he's out there working working uh, working at ground level because hey, at the end of the day, he knows the importance of the stuff as well and knows the importance of going through uh, and getting that stuff done. So you know the team that we're building around us, um, we have some absolute knowledge uh, coming through. So 
Thank you so much for um, joining us tonight, Steve. For those of you who are out there, if you enjoyed uh, tonight's um, episode, then, hey, feel free. If you didn't watch last week's, then go through and have a look at that. Um, oh, sorry, last month's, last uh, fortnight, whatever it was, uh, with Ed around the use of tourniquets. That was just absolutely awesome uh, yep. to, to have Ed on board there. This one has been fantastic as well. Steve, I'm pretty sure we're going to have to do this again at some point, man. Um, <laughs> hey, man. Maybe even I'll bow out and let a couple of big brains get in there with you and Ned. You guys can uh, sit there and, and freak out. <laughs> and I don't know. But, um, hey, thank you, everybody. If you, if you did enjoy tonight, check out the other episode that we've got up there. That's going to be around. Um, and also feel free to share this around. Information and knowledge is power, okay? And in an hour, it is insane, the stuff that you can learn. Just because you know it, somebody else might not know it. So pushing the information out a little further. And, again, if you do have any questions, just hit us up. That's one of the things. You're now part of the family. Um, of course, we have our family here at PracMed. Everybody who comes through the door, we will answer your questions as soon as we possibly can. The line never goes dead in that sense. It's not just clipping the ticket around here. We actually believe in what we do because we know what works and we know what doesn't, having been there and done that. Team, thank you so much. Steve, again, thank you. You're an absolute legend, man. Keep doing the good work that you do uh, every single day where you work. And uh, team, stay safe out there. Remember, trauma sleeps on no one. Semper paratus. Always ready. Good night, New Zealand. Take care. <laughs>